Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 3.40, the microphone is on, and uh, I guess it's time to start. So, um, my name is uh, Salvatore Orlando, and uh, I have been a cont regular contributor to OpenStack networking for a few releases cycle. In the past, I also used to be the part of what is called the core developer team of Neutron, means the people that basically can approve patches. And I'm now not anymore part of the team, more on the way to ret my retirement, but you know, still contributing. And today we are going to talk about uh, writing Neutron plugins, when you really need to write a Neutron plugin. And this talk is specifically uh, aimed at discussing how to write Neutron plugins uh, uh, for the Neutron Stadium, which is the sort of revolution which has happened in the past year, which on the one hand has empowered developers, integrators, for developing their plugin and drivers uh, in a completely independent way, but on the other hand has introduced a new set of processes, which in some cases might be a little bit challenging. I mean, probably you are already aware of most of these processes, and the aim of this talk is to put all the things together in a single place. And, you know, um, I know that it's 3.40 p.m., we are all a bit tired, and so I'll try to make it as most as entertaining as possible. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I know that a technical talk is probably never going to be really entertaining in any way, but I mean, I'll try, I'll try to make my best. Worst case, I can start dancing uh, around. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's, uh, let's start with a bit of a summary. So, uh, in the first part of the talk, I will start confusing you with definitions of plugin, service plugin, and drivers. But I also try to put a, a little bit of order in uh, when it comes to taking a decision whether you really need a Neutron plugin or more like, you know, especially when you're doing ML2 and ML2 driver, because that's a decision that often, often you know, if you also look at the mailing list, uh, that's a decision that. Uh, uh, it's often not really obvious, and people tend to think that whatever they do, they have to do an ML2 driver, which is not necessarily true. And then, just to make things more confusing, we'll introduce the Neutron Stadium. I mean, probably most of, most of you are already aware of what this Neutron Stadium is, so it's not going to be big news for you, but the last part of the presentation, and possibly the longest part of the presentation, is about thriving in the Neutron Stadium. So how to deal with the new set uh, of procedures and rules and technical differences that you have to deal with for uh, having your plugin or your driver living in this stadium. So what is a Neutron plugin? A Neutron plugin is basically the engine that implements the whole Neutron API. So Neutron itself is that tiny layer that you see in the blue box with the API on top of it. That's just a tiny layer. It doesn't do a lot of stuff. It, it does authentication. It actually, Neutron doesn't do even authentication. It talks to Keystone for doing authentication. So, you know, it just have the hooks for doing authentication. It does authorization, validates the request, uh, and then dispatches the request to the plugin. Now, all the important stuff happens in that layer, in the plugin. And the plugin, for instance, if you look at the reference control plane implementation, deals with uh, communication with the agents over RPC channels, agents you know, like layer two agent, layer three agent, the DHCP agent. Instead, if you look at commercial plugins, or I mean other plugins, it just, uh, acts as a proxy towards uh, uh, a third-party controller, uh, storing anyway data in the Neutron database. And in some cases, like for instance, the Open Contract plugin, it's even simpler. It's just a pure proxy towards a third party. It doesn't even, uh, it's completely stateless too. So this is the basic architecture. And uh, plugin, it's uh, maybe a single component, or as it is in this picture, it might be multiple components. And this really depends on whether you have just a standalone plugin implementing all the APIs, or whether you have a set of core and services plugin. So what do we mean by core here? 
Even if you are, we are now in 2015 and Neutron has been around for five years, we still call core functionality just basic uh, layer two networking plus, plus IPAM. So, you know, <laughs> in Neutron, it might be surprising, but uh, layer three networking, layer three capabilities, uh, and even security groups, which are basic functionalities required for integration with Nova, are still considered extensions. But the way it works, so when it comes to dispatching requests in Neutron, you have, uh, on the API side, you have the core API and the various extensions. Here, for instance, we have just uh, the core extension, layer three extensions, and the, I mean, the security group extension that for some reason, I've called it the firewall in this slide, but, uh, and you have different options. It sort of depends on what you deploy in your backend. You can have either a single plugin implementing all, uh, all your APIs, as is in the picture on the left, you can have, for instance, a plugin doing uh, the core functionality and the layer three functionality, and then another plugin doing firewall. Or, for instance, you can have a distinct plugin for every functionality. Uh, what are the differences? Where you have a standalone plugin, obviously, we are probably more looking at the integrated solution. So, on the other end, when you have uh, multiple plugins for different services, you are probably looking at a solution where you have a different technology providing different services. And uh, the additional challenge here is that uh, you have also to consider uh, interaction among the various plugins. So this is the basic picture, hopefully not too confusing. Uh, to give you some examples, when you run the default stuff uh, which is what is tested by Neutron upstream in the gate, you're running uh, a plugin for uh, the basic functionality, the core functionality, which is the ML2 plugin, and, and then a, a layer three reference implementation plugin, which does communication with the layer three agent. So the basic implement, in the basic implementation, basically, uh, sorry, there are too many basically, as uh, <laughs> in the reference implementation you have uh, a core, let's say the core ML2 plugin, which implements the core API and the security group API. And then you have uh, the layer three reference plugin, uh, which is called L3 router plugin or something like that, which implements the layer three API. Yep. So the question is what about DHCP? This is a good, good question because the DHCP agent is a key component of the Neutron Reference Control Plan. But it's not in that picture for a very simple reason that it doesn't have, we don't have a DHCP API and we don't have a DHCP plugin. Communication with the DHCP agent is entirely performed by the ML2 plugin. As a part, for instance, when you react to a create subnet operation, that's where you have a command sent to the DHCP agent. So uh, if this is the, the picture that you see here is just the, uh, what happens in Neutron server. What happens in Neutron server is that you have uh, APIs dispatching call to plugins. But then there is another part of the picture, which is the integration between uh, uh, the plugins implementing the reference control plane and the various agents. So for instance, there will be uh, the core plugin, in which case is, this case is ML2, which interacts with the layer two agent for doing uh, uh, VIF wiring, and so ensuring layer two connectivity, and securing VIFs by implementing security groups, but it also talks with the DHCP agent to program the DNS mask instances running in network namespaces that then distribute addresses to virtual machines. And similarly, the layer three agent communicate, sorry, the layer three plugin communicates with the layer three agent. So in order to avoid the confusion, this picture here is just neutron server. The agents are here on the bottom. You don't see them, but they are all here. Anyway, so uh, some plugins like ML2 are a bit particular because they have not just, they have drivers too. So that's kind of two level in direction where you have uh, a neutron server that dispatches call to a plugin, and then the ML2 plugin which dispatches call to a driver. The difference here in this two, uh, in having the advantage of having two levels of indirection is that uh, a lot of boilerplate code, which is required specifically specifically for uh, doing database operation, 
sits in the ML2 plugin, and the driver developer only has to implement the actions which are performed at specific moments during request processing. For instance, in the case of the ML2 plugin, of the ML2 plugin you have the pre-commit operation, the post-commit operations, which are respectively performed before the database operation is performed and after the database operation is performed. Uh, and also, another characteristic of the ML2 plugin is that you can have multiple mechanism drivers, you can have a hierarchical port binding, and that allows you also to manage uh, heterogeneous uh, fabrics in your data center, but all, I mean, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that this is entirely exclusively pertaining uh, the layer to layer, and therefore simply uh, with binding uh, and ensuring basic layer to connectivity. Uh, a similar architecture is also implemented by the reference plugin for the advanced services. Uh, as we discussed uh, in the previous slides, you know, there were different services for Neutron. Some services are the so-called advanced services, uh, which have been uh, split out in different repositories as part of the Neutron Stadium operation, and they have different plugins which adopt the same driver architecture. So, now, the question for you is, should I implement a plugin or an ML2 driver? Uh, let's start with a, use, with, a, with a real case, and the real case is the case of uh, OVN plugin. I mean, you probably are aware of what uh, are all aware of what OVN is. Yesterday, Ben, Justin, or the other OVN folks gave a talk exactly in this room. And uh, so, uh, what happened with the OVN plugin was that its development started as an ML2 driver. At some point, you realize that uh, ML2 does more than ML2, I'm sorry, that OVN does more than layer two. There are other services. So, you know, just because of this, the ML2 driver alone is not sufficient. But also, you realize that for the very architecture of, ML, of OVN, it's not like you can have multiple drivers uh, that interact together and cooperate. So, what happened was that people at some point, developers at some point, realized that the ML2 architecture really didn't make a lot of sense for OVN, and OVN has now switched to a standalone plugin, which is a single plugin implementing all the uh, network services exposed by Neutron. But in general, the workflow could be something like this. You start asking yourself a question, do I have only layer two to implement? If you are just implementing only layer two, for instance, what you want to integrate with Neutron is uh, the switch that's running your data center, which exposes an API, or I mean, which, which you can configure somehow, then you need to ask yourself, the device that I want to control, does it interact with other devices in my data center? For instance, is that a top of rack switch and then you have leaf switches that are part of the same network? So that maybe you need some sort of, you want to have Neutron doing some sort of orchestration, configuring both switches and ensuring that you have uh, you know, a single uh, layer to connectivity across all these devices. If the answer to this question is yes as well, then you definitely need an ML2 driver. If the answer to this question is no, you can just implement a plugin for the core Neutron API and be good with it. But I have to tell the truth, but the thing is that even if it, the answer to this question is no, you can still implement an ML2 driver because even if you don't really need ML2, you will still have the advantage of not having to deal with uh, re-implementing uh, all, the, I mean, doing all the DB support code, you just can leverage whatever ML2 already provides for you. But, on the other end, let's go back to the first question. If you don't have just layer two, but for instance you have other services, just layer three for instance if you want, and you need to mix, uh, you, have, you need to ask yourself whether you need to, you are able to mix and match those services. What I mean by mix and match. Like for instance, can I run my layer three services on top of somebody else layer two solution? For instance, if you are, uh, if you are have a, a wonderful uh, integration with some layer three product, can it run on top of the ML2 plugin with OpenV switch? Can it run on top of, uh, let's say, uh, layer two with Midonet? If the answer is yes, then you need 
definitely need to go for a modular approach. A modular approach where you have distinct plugins for uh, when you have distinct plugins for uh, distinct services. And so we are going in this, uh, on this box. Among the various services, are you providing layer two? Yes. If you are providing a layer two, you need to ask yourself the same question as before. If you need to interact with other drivers, then you need an, M an ML2 driver. If you don't need to interact with other drivers, you don't need an ML2 driver. But since you don't do only layer two, you definitely need to provide service plugins for every service that you provide. Finally, if you are in a condition where you are driving a third-party controller which completely manages your virtualized network, as it is the case of, uh, of OVN, or as it is the case, for instance, of Midonet, or it could be the case of uh, commercial controllers like the plugins that we maintain at VMware, definitely the best solution for you is to do a standalone plugin. So, I have uh, this diagram which is very clear, just like a tube map. <laughs> and, uh, but hopefully, you know, it kind of provides some guidance for uh, people that are approaching the task of writing a plugin. So now that we have, uh, we have a very clear picture of what a plugin is, of what a service plugin is, what the driver is, and how they interact, we will introduce the Neutron Stadium. As you can see, there is actually a Neutron Stadium and people are all cheering for Neutron. And uh, what, what means the Neutron Stadium? Uh, how many of you are aware, actually, of what the Neutron Stadium is? Well, I need to talk about the Neutron Stadium then. <laughs> so, uh, how many of you are actually aware of the OpenStack Big Tent? Fine. So, the OpenStack Big Tent is a, uh, let's say, it's a concept that we can assume that we are fairly uh, comfortable with. W the thing is that within, within, Neutron, within Neutron, we have decided to build a stadium within the big tent. I know it doesn't make any sense having a stadium in a tent. It should be the other way around. But you know, uh, in Neutron, we are a bunch of people that used to do things that don't make a lot of sense. So let's not be too much worried about it. The concept here is that within Neutron, we have the ability of having multiple projects with uh, a sort of independent uh, uh, governance from a technical perspective. So every uh, project gets its own repository with their own core team. And uh, this means that you have a lot of freedom. You have a lot of freedom of developing the code in the way that you fit best see best fit for your project. You don't need to go and ask the Neutron core team for approval of uh, blueprints which pertain to your project. You don't have to ask the Neutron core team for approval of patches that pertain to your, uh, your code. Uh, for, your in, for the integration with your backend, you are fully in control. Uh, from, a, from a, let's say, OpenStack governance perspective, uh, this does not change a lot. It doesn't mean that you are an OpenStack first level project with your own PTL and whatever with the elections. You are just, from an OpenStack perspective, you're still part of the Neutron project, of the OpenStack networking project. But within Neutron, you, have, uh, you are, from a technical perspective, you are completely independent. However, this comes with a cost. So, uh, these are the advantages here. So the advantages are that you are self-managed, each plugin or driver has a distinct development and core team, and uh, it, each plugin or driver lives in its own code repository. Uh, and uh, there is a limited oversight from the Neutron core team, so pretty much you can merge whatever you want it in, the, in your plugin. And uh, you, uh, you just you have to Optionally, you can decide to coordinate with the rest, with the Neutron for doing a release, but if you want, you can release whenever you want. So these are the good aspects, which means in, um, we'll, if you remember how it was Neutron, uh, let's say, until the end of uh, Ice House, uh, does anybody remember what it meant for a vendor to merge for a vendor or anybody doing a plugin which was not ML2, uh, merging a patch into Neutron for a, for a plugin specific patch until to IceHouse, it meant that you push the patch like at the beginning of the release cycle, and then perhaps a year ago, a year later, that patch would be reviewed and merged. Uh, this 
led to a situation where uh, there was a queue of about uh, 10 plugins waiting to be merged in the neutron core tree. And there was a, a backlog of, uh, I think, over 50 blueprints, pl plugin specific blueprints that uh, were not even reviewed or approved, nor targeted to any religion, release. So basically, plugin development was pretty much stuck. And the Neutron Core team was uh, really busy with dealing with, uh, uh, with the plugin code, which often the people in the Neutron Core team didn't have any clue of what that code did. And so that's why it was decided to move all the plugin code out of tree. This decision has paid off very well, but there are some uh, caveats, something that uh, a few challenges in uh, doing this uh, that we are going to address in the last 20 minutes of this talk. And uh, what best way of addressing this caveat than uh, you know, doing, uh, uh, doing it with a, a concrete example. And this is and this for this reason that we are introducing here, we are taking a chance in this talk to introducing a new plugin, the plugin for human-defined networking. What is human-defined networking? It's a chance for you all to discover the human side of IT. I mean, you are all, aren't you bored of network automation? Don't you think software-defined networking has failed their promises? I mean, it's been like, how many years? Like four years they've been promising you to have uh, uh, fully virtualized networking in your environments, and that never happened, right? It's time to stop and go back to the past and rediscover the human side of IT. And this is why we are introducing here a human-defined networking plugin for Neutron, which completely redefines how virtual networking works. So the main concept, you have a REST API uh, for doing requests, which is the Neutron API, and all the requests are, are converted into emails, which are sent to the networking team in your office. Stop doing uh, like RPC, stop using these agents. You don't need these agents. I mean, if you consider how much a single instance on a layer two agent is costing you, you'll find out that hiring somebody, it's much cheaper for you. Then. The, the process, you don't have to worry about uh, scaling or not scaling because it's implicitly asynchronous and eventually consistent. Also, uh, there is, uh, you don't need to worry about quality of service, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, time processing requests, requests because it's karma-based, there is karma-based request prioritization. If you are not, if you are nice to an IT guy or probably you, know, you buy him some chocolate or you know, a beer, you can rest assured that your request will be served in a very quick time. <laughs> so this is our, these are, these are the concept of the HDN plugin. And this is very simple architecture. As you can see, there is the REST interface, the message bus, which is based on email. At the moment, I'm sorry, I have only email, but I swear to you, I'm planning to implement also phone and fax. And somehow, also, you know, post, really. You can send a letter, put a stamp on it, and eventually it will be delivered to the IT team that will uh, cheerfully proceed to satisfy your request. So, I mean, when you have to you think about create a neutron port or create a neutron network and you try to automate across all the switches where you can have somebody going there. I mean, and let no, 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 I don't want even to get started on scaling out. I mean, scaling out, what means that like you deploy more agents and you make the agents multi-threaded uh, and then you say, okay, we can use a uh, uh, monitoring of the OVS DV, DB to get notifications and immediately proceed all the changes. Come on, you can just hire more people, you know. The more people you are, you hire, the more the system scale. And as we well to you, I mean, it, it, it might be actually true that with all the money that you spend in maintaining your network and virtualization infrastructure, actually hiring people will be cheaper. Anyway, let's look at the, now let's, let's get serious, sorry guys, let's get serious, let's stop playing, uh, let's look at the architecture of, this, uh, of the ultimate plugin that's going to solve all the problems of your data centers. So we, have, um, we are implementing the core APIs, the layer three API, layer three APIs, security group APIs, and then we have an additional API extension which is specific to the, um, uh, to the HDN plugin which is for administrative tasks. So, and the, our architecture is that we have decided to go for a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, 
services and plugins because we want to progressively roll out roll this out in your data center so for instance if you are already deploying ml2 with some random layer 3 stuff you can start by chucking away your layer 3 stuff and introducing ml2 and over time you can roll in also you know the core plugin and the security group and get rid of those also of ml2 with whatever sdn thing you're using completely useless the stuff so Anyway, if you want to implement now this thing in the Neutron Stadium, you need to keep a few things in mind. It's not that easy as it was uh, before, just do the code and uh, drop it in the Neutron Code Tree. You are running outside of the Neutron Code Tree. So there are a few things to keep in mind. One, how to uh, uh, do successfully do development with this first stuff and therefore integrate it with DevStack. The second thing is that you likely need some changes in the Neutron database schema. And since you are not anymore in the Neutron source code tree, you need, you need, we need a solution for doing from an external plugin changes in the Neutron database schema. And um, then we, since we have uh, multiple plugins which interact each other, we need another solution for uh, ensuring that this integration works correctly uh, and finally, we have to deal with the testing, all this stuff. So let's start with DevStack integration, which is probably the, mo the simplest bit, because DevStack, uh, since uh, a year so far, has had uh, a pluggable, as a plugin structure. So rather than going into DevStack and doing changes for explicitly supporting HDN, you can uh, uh, just declare that you're using a DevStack plugin and drop the DevStack plugin in the HDN source code tree, which is exactly what you are doing here. The DevStack plugin, it's very simple. It, it's just a script. And uh, this script gets loaded when DevStack is running. You can do three things. One is to execute something at specific stage during DevStack's execution, which are, uh, these stages are before service configuration, uh, before service, sorry, before, ser before software installation, before service configuration, and after service configuration. Then uh, you can also override default values that are uh, 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 DevStack default values. And in the specific case of Neutron, you can redefine some of the Neutron plugin specific Neutron procedure to be uh, to have them specific to your plugin. So let's have a, a look uh, of uh, about how it's done here. I need to zoom in a little bit. So this is the DevStack plugin. I hope you can see it. Uh, probably need to make it slightly bigger. So this is a, an example of, uh, of DevStack plugin. Uh, as you can see, the code for the HDN plugin has been shared as available on GitHub. So you have a, you have a, there's a bunch of functions which are uh, basically override of a plugin-specific natural neutron function. For instance, you know, is neutron OVS-based plugin return one, which means no, because as the comment says, OVL, o o OVS is totally evil. and. Uh, all the other functions which are for install, installing the agent packages uh, or configuring the HCP agent or configuring the Airtree tree agent are just empty functions because we don't need all that stuff. And we just need some functions for configuring Neutron for running with the HDN plugin. And here, uh, configure HDN plugin is the is the most important function because basically it configures all the parameters which we need to run this plugin, which are pretty much just email settings and that's it. But the most important thing is that uh, this is how the DevStack plugin actually works. This is the skeleton of every DevStack plugin that you may want to implement. You have basically, if, it's, uh, if your service is enabled, where your service is your uh, specific plugin, then you have three phases which are install, post config and post extra. Typically, all the plugin configuration for a Neutron plugin is done in this phase, the post config phase. And basically, you just have to plug there your shell script, which does the plugin configuration. So let's go back to our discussion of uh, the HDM plugin, and let's see how we solve the problem for the database schema. Um, the HDM plugin just adds a little table for uh, 
managing these uh, operator's tasks, you know, when you create a network, it adds a task for an operator where you kindly ask the operator to create a network, to set up a network for you in the data center. And, uh, but the problem is that uh, since the HDN uh, plugin is living in a distinct uh, source code tree, we can't alter the neutron schema directly. Uh, so we add a schema migration, which is specific to our plugin. Just like neutron migrations, also plugin-specific migration are managed using Alembic. And each sub-project uh, can get its own distinct Alembic environment. Uh, this is something that you have to keep in mind, that uh, each sub-project has a distinct Alembic environment. And uh, you can have multiple branches, just like for Neutron. I don't know if, you, if you're aware, Neutron has uh, multiple bra Alembic branches now, and this is for making sure that you can do online migrations without having to restart your service. You can do the same thing in your plugin, because basically you will inherit the same uh, environment that Neutron uses. Uh, and you can also specify, if you want, dependencies between your branches, but be careful, you can't specify a yet a dependency with uh, a migration which is in Neutron. So basically, if you want to say, add my table for tasks, uh, not before the table X, Y, Z is added to Neutron, that's something that you cannot do that, you cannot yet do, right, because these migrations are uh, separated. I don't want to go into the technical details because this is very, very boring, but here on the slides you have all the references. The first reference is uh, an example of how it's done for the HDN plugin, and the other two references here are links to the Neutron developer documentation where all the, these uh, details, all these uh, uh, things are discussed in, in detail. So uh, one important remark that I have is that uh, yeah, the Neutron developer documentation has all that you need for making sure that you can successfully implement and maintain a plugin out of three. When you go to the Neutron developer uh, documentation, you have two sections. One is policies and one is Neutron DevRef. Uh, in policies, you, find, you will find all the process the, the process aspects which are required for you as a maintainer of an external plugin and all the technical details are instead in the neutron defref side so we say uh, as we said we had um, uh, several plugins which can be unaware of each other so what happens for instance when you create a network uh, using the hdn plugin and uh, as a result of creating a network, you have to add a task for an HDN operator to go and configure that, that network in, uh, in, in the data center. So you do this using the Neutron callbacks mechanism. This is a mechanism which has been introduced in the Kilo release of Neutron, and it's very comfortable for making sure that you can react to events which are triggered in other plugins, rather than going manually to alter the code of the plugin to interact with your plugin. So this way, plugins do not need to be aware of each other. Uh, and you, in your plugin, you can just subscribe for events. So for instance, if you want to run a callback after a port is created, you just have to subscribe, reg register a callback, and subscribe it, uh, it to the event dot after create, uh, to the after create event for a port resource. And that callback will be executed after a port is created, for instance. Uh, a typical example of this case in where you have a service plugin which makes use of ports, as is, for instance, a layer three service plugin, which uses ports for router interfaces, and you want to add a callback to react to a delete port event. That in case, if the uh, core plugin tries to delete a port using your L3 plugin, you can register this callback to prevent this from happening. And uh, plugins basically just generate ev events, as you can see here in the slides, by calling notify. And when you, you, know, when you call a notify, the registry basically takes all the callbacks that are registered to that particular uh, pair of uh, resource and event, and uh, simply calls the callbacks, invokes the callbacks. And for the HDN plugin, this means that whenever a resource is created, we trigger an after create event, 
And uh, then the HDN task extensions register the callbacks, and there is similar behavior for update and delete events. What happens is that you create a network, and there is a task which is, uh, uh, it, it, the callback automatically creates a task for uh, uh, an HDN operator, sends him an email. When the HDN operator reads the email, it gets the task ID that pertains to that specific operation. It goes to the HDN plugin, gets the details of the task, goes, you know, goes to the data center, plugs cable, configures the switches, uh, has a cup of coffee, then comes back to the computer and says, task completed, okay. And that's how the workflow works. And, I mean, I, um, that's pretty much it. It's just very simple. <laughs> There's really not much to say. And uh, now, one thing that you have to keep in mind and that uh, will annoy you a lot is that since the now you are living in, the, in a separate repository, what happens is that actually the people that are doing changes in Neutron are not able, are not able to know that they might be breaking your plugin. Uh, this actually happens uh, more often than you wish for because uh, the great majority of Neutron plugins are actually inherited the so-called uh, database mixins, which are a bunch of base classes which do common database operations. So often it happens that somebody does a, a change in the database class, that change upstream is only tested uh, with uh, with the ML2 plugin, and it doesn't even realize that it's breaking your code. So you have to be prepared for failures. That you, can, you can't just avoid them from happening. I believe that uh, for the plugin that my team is maintaining, we have them on a weekly basis. I mean, on a good week, we have a one failure a week. On a bad week, we have one failure a day. So you have to prepare for it. It means constant, constantly test your plugin. And, uh, in the, in the vast majority of cases, I'll say 95% of cases, you just have to run a unit test to find out that your plugin is broken, to pinpoint the root cause and fix it. Most cases, if you don't let this failure uh, you know, accumulate, and therefore causing bit rotting, in most cases, if you, inter if you uh, act uh, promptly, it's just a matter of a few minutes to push a patch to fix your plugin. And, but the bottom line is that uh, there is nothing that you can do that. This is a, a consequences of the introduction of the Neutron Stadium, and you just have to be prepared with it and deal with it. So testing is very important for your plugin. I don't think we have a, um, a lot of time to discuss about testing because we are three minutes from time, but the rule of thumb here, whatever you are, whatever you're doing in your plugin, if Neutron tests it, your sub-project should do that too. So does Neutron run an API job? Yes, you should run an API job too. Uh, does Neutron run integration tests? Yes, you must run integration tests too. Uh, do you have to report the votes from your CI upstream? Probably not, that's not important. That's for two reasons. First is that uh, maintaining a CI that votes upstream requires you to do an awful lot of work because if you consider how many patches are submitted every day upstream, this means that you have to need to have a CI infrastructure which is ready to test hundreds of patches a day. And that's probably asking too much to a plugin maintainer. Uh, the, second, the second reason for not voting upstream is that unfortunately uh, developers are going to ignore the vote of the third party CI. You can put a minus one uh, because it's breaking your plugin, but that minus one is probably going to be overridden and in the worst case it's going to annoy people. But it's an important information for you, not for the other developer. There's important information for you that a patch that uh, creates you a problem is about to be merged or is already merged and you need to react quickly to fix your plugin. Perfect. To conclude this discussion, and I, hope I see that just a few of you are sleeping, I see just one guy sleeping, he just woke up. <laughs> I'm going to beat you after the talk. 
you're mine. <laughs> and, uh, and basically, uh, other challenges that you have to deal with is release management. Release management basically it's uh, the only thing that you can do on your own for your plugin. You have to coordinate release management with a member of the Neutron release team, uh, but the Neutron release team did a very good job of describing the process in detail in the sub in this uh, the document which is linked here. And uh, then the requirements for your project. And dealing with the requirements is difficult, it's tiring, it's boring. So th the best thing that you could do is just subscribe to the requirements contract and uh, you'll find more details at that address. And when you subscribe the requirement, requirement contract, you will not have to deal anymore with the requirements. You receive periodic updates from the global requirements OpenStack project, and that will be pretty much everything you need. You don't need to do anything else. I mean, um, there is a caveat here, is that if you have special requirements for your project, you need to push that special requirements into OpenStack requirements. So that's the only caveat. Uh, one note about Oslo Incubator. We've seen that many plugins are importing stuff for neutron.openstack.common. That's uh, not such a good practice. You need to imp import stuff directly from the Oslo Incubator. And finally, we already discussed what you need to do for your CI, but if you want to look at more details, that's, uh, that's your link. And uh, well, just to conclude, don't forget about documenting your plugin, about providing an admin guide for your plugin, uh, providing a developer guide for your plugin. And now it's uh, really everything from my side. I would like to thank you for your time. And any question that you have, you are welcome to ask. I hope I did not bother you too much. And uh, please install and spread the word about the HDM plugin. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can speak to Mike. It's a it's a quick question on the HDN uh, reference. I didn't see any mention of Elbaz. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I'm looking for contributors. I'm looking for contributors. And uh, the way I'm going to implement load balancer, I'm not really sure how to implement. I will not really, I mean, probably we can use, uh, we can use like hardware load balancer, but I was actually considering giving people, you know, plugging cable run in a random way and, uh, but at some point, I probably need some sort of hardware load balancer, but I'm finding a way to make it more human as well. Make yeah, maybe, maybe for next summit, because but, I mean, we are tired of SDN. We need to implement this HDN stuff and make it the reference implementation. Uh, any other question? Uh, it seems uh, that uh, we don't have any other questions. So thank you very much for your time and uh, spread the word about HDN. Thanks.